Welcome to the Times of Industry show. I have a first time guest, a rising star on YouTube, man, if I, if I might call him that, Stephen Van Mitre, StephenVanMitre.com. You can watch his YouTube channel. I'll have the, the link down below. He's on Twitter as well. Phenomenal information. Um, he's actually a licensed uh, financial advisor. So this is a very interesting show because you have a person whose profession it is to look at the markets, see what's going on, leave and, you know, live and breathe what's going on and actually invest uh, funds for other people. So I am very uh, happy to have you on the, the show and thank you for joining us, Stephen, and excuse my voice today. Leo, it's a pleasure to be invited on your show. I was looking very, very much forward to this today. Okay. Well, you know what? I want to ask you, first of all, about a topic that, that you um, uh, recently released a video on, which is insolvency versus liquidity. Now, obviously, come March, you know, eight to eight months ago, eight, nine months ago, if the federal government and the central banks, had they not intervened, we would have had insolvencies everywhere. Instead of that, we have liquidity everywhere and it's drying up. And now they're talking about, you know, more liquidity, et cetera. Uh, there's a price to pay for printing currency. There's a price to pay for letting debt evaporate. What was that video all about? And, and it, can you tell people the main message that they can take away? Yeah, so what happens is you have these liquidity events where the underlying mechanisms of the financial system start to grind to a halt. And a lot of people don't know this, but every day there's billions of dollars of overnight and short-term loans, be, uh, dollar loans being conducted. I mean, it, it, it's just something you would never know what's going on and you shouldn't need to know what's going on. It's just part of the financial system that keeps the gears or grease running and, and everything moving along real smoothly. Well, what okay. starts to happen is when these short-term lenders, and these are just people who have lots of dollars that you know, are looking to make you know, a little bit of interest on a loan that effectively is, is risk-free because, you know, right, Lear, if I, if I was going to loan you money knowing I'm going to get it back tomorrow, I, I don't perceive there's a lot of risk in that. And You're not talking about repos, right? Right, right, exactly. So okay. what we're seeing, you know, what we saw in March is these people didn't want to lend. And we started seeing that before March in the repo market. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the gears started to grind up, the grease that was lubricating, the dollars started to go away, and the stock market and the economy started to nosedive. And of course, that's where the Federal Reserve steps in and says, okay, we'll, we'll be the lender of last resort. And, and they're really good at it. This is what the Fed can do. You know, they can come out and offer repo loans and currency swaps and all these great things and get dollars out there. And of course, the whole premise of this is that this, the problem that causes this is really short term in nature. You know, think of it maybe like a, a, a payday loan. You know, I, I've got a, a bigger bill than, you know, maybe a medical bill that came in that I wasn't expecting. I'm not being paid for a week and I got to pay that bill now or else. And so I need to go get some money. It's not that I won't have money. Yeah, it, the premise is this, it's it's a, like a bridge. Yeah, it's just the, the mechanisms got wonky and, you know, people just needed a bridge. And that's what the, the sure. Fed is perfectly designed to handle those problems. And they did. And so what happens okay. now is investors think, okay, the worst is behind us. I can take you know, exceedingly high amounts of risk in the market. And we're seeing that, you know, you, you look at, I think the highest uh, number of call options since, you know, the dot com bubble. And so everyone is like, okay, that was it. There's the end of the recession. Everything's cool. And they don't understand that there's an insolvency crisis that hasn't happened yet, which is synonymous with, periods where you have a, a, a shortage of dollars. So what happens is everyone thinks this problem is gone and it hasn't gone away. There are still lots of people that need dollars that aren't getting them. The underlying economy from the lending market isn't creating them. You know, the dollars that we do have aren't moving really quickly as evident of the velocity of M2. And so we have this dollar shortage and the recession won't end until you have the insolvency event where essentially everything craters down, which most people will remember of the, you know, the great financial crisis and the dot-com bubble, the, you know, everything always ends the same way. You, you have a liquidity crisis and then everyone thinks it's cool. And then you have an insolvency event, which effectively turns into another liquidity crisis. But now you have the point where instead of me saying, hey, look, I just need a little loan to get over this, you know, this little hump. I say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I can't pay that bill either. I don't have the money. And next thing okay. you know, 
boom, everything starts to fall apart. Okay, so so are, are you referring to to small businesses and to individuals? Where is the insolvency coming from? It, it could come from anywhere. It could come from consumers, small businesses, mid-sized, large companies. I mean, you know, going back to 2008, where did it start with Lehman Brothers, right? I mean, who would have thought that they would end up failing? So it, it could just fail at anywhere along the, the curve. It just depends. You know, I, I like to look at it as musical chairs, right? So if we have okay. 10 people, you have nine chairs, right? The music plays. When it stops, we already know one person's out. And that's normal in a debt-based economy. But okay. when there is an insolvency event and a major dollar shortage, instead of one chair being missing, it's like when the music stops, there's 10 people, maybe four chairs. And then next thing you know, the people that would have paid on their bills wanted to, all of a sudden now they can't. And they have to make a choice. Do I hang on to my money or pay my bill? And it, it can be at the corporate level, it can be at the consumer level, it can be at both. And I expect okay. it to be. Okay. But it, funny you mentioned all of this because I just saw a chart about uh, the shortage of dollars, um, which uh, plays into this. And this reminds me a lot of what they called in, in the 0809, the trickle effect. The, the money has to trickle down so that there, there will be money in, in Wall Street and then in Bay Street, I'm sorry. And also um, a stat that, uh, that uh, about 20% of the Wilshire 5,000 are zombie companies. It was basically companies that if they were not part of indices, and wouldn't have uh, access to funding, they, they would be gone, 20%, that's a, that's a lot of companies. So that's very interesting. One topic above any other, Stephen, in, in the last five years, if there's one topic that drives everyone nuts is inflation versus deflation. Like QE is inflationary, QE is deflationary, technology is deflation, and it goes on. And on. So you have did a nice video about whether or not QE plus a fiscal, um, you know, policy is that inflationary? So you, you start a whole new uh, camp. So talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the reason I had to do that video is because even though there are people that believe QE is inflationary, I I have and can prove that it isn't. I mean, we look at why does Fed even do QE? It's because they're afraid of deflation. They're seeing it coming. Yes. And then in itself, it actually creates deflation, which is even more bizarre that the solution to the problem creates more of the problem until you get rates low enough where you can actually spur lending growth and get inflation. So, so we know it's deflationary. And then there's people like, okay, well, well, fiscal stimulus. Well, that's inflationary because we're going to give money to people like Steve and Lior and, and they're going to go spend it. And it's going to be just crazy inflationary. But what people don't understand about fiscal is it's not creating new money. It's, it's taking, you know, I like to use examples like Robin Hood. He robs from the rich to give the poor. Well, the federal government borrows from those who have dollars and gives to those who effectively don't. That, it, it, there's no new dollars created. Now, the hope you, in the way it can become- Q, just, to, just, to, just to make sure everyone understands what you're saying. In QE, you don't create new dollars? QE, you do not create, there's no dollars created. Explain that mechanism so everyone can understand that. Then. Well, okay, well, Okay, so if we go back to quantitative easing and what quantitative easing is, it's just yeah. a reserve swap. So a large commercial bank has, is required to hold reserves. And they, um, of the things that are allowed to do, they like to hold U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. U.S. Treasury securities are considered a higher, you know, very high, I think the highest tier uh, collateral and mortgage-backed securities are either a notch or two down, but it's immaterial. They, they like to hold them. They're mm -hmm. easy to get. And all the Fed comes in and does is says, okay, we're going to take those off of your hands and we're going to give you a, what's called a reserve asset or an overnight reserve. And that overnight reserve, again, you're, you're moving one off the table and putting something back. There's no, the net, there's no change. So there is no money actually printed. The banks, the banks can't do anything with those reserve assets. I mean, they're very limited. All they can do, they can sit on them. They can use them as collateral for creating loans, but or, or they, but the banks have to be willing to risk their own capital, which we're, they're seeing they don't want to do. And then they can use them as a deposit when they go to a treasury auction. So they can say, okay, here, I'm going to post this 
you know, as a deposit and we'll pay you later when, you know, if, when you need the money. And so it, the, these reserve assets stay in the financial system. They don't leave they there can't be used to go buy stocks or anything like that. So there it's not money printing. And that's okay. you know, something that a lot of people don't understand. They, they, you know, the name of it, quantitative easing, you, it implies that, Hey, it's got to make things better and create money. And the fact that it, is, it doesn't at all. So when you see the Fed's balance sheet rising and growing and growing, what does that uh, originate from? Where is that money created from? Well, all it is is they're just accounting for the fact that they're taking these treasuries and mortgage-backed securities off of the bank's balance sheet and putting it on their own. And then they're saying, okay, we're going to give you this reserve asset, and over here we're accounting for what we've got. Understood. That's all it is. Okay. So go back to QE plus fiscal. Right. So then we have fiscal, right, which is, you know, take from those or borrow from those who have dollars to give to those who need them. Again, no new dollars are created in that process. Now, the hope with fiscal is you give money to somebody and they go out and they spend it on discretionary goods and services. That's and that could that's where you could create inflation from. The problem is, is if people use it to pay off debt or they just sit on it because they're afraid that they're going to lose their job or they've lost their job and aren't going to be able to get one it becomes disinflationary and then ultimately deflationary. So now what you have is people saying, okay, well, maybe Steve will agree with you, but I'm not 100% on that. But if you put the two together, right? And now all of a sudden you've got the perfect storm for creating you know, just hyperinflation. So the notion that you have deflationary plus deflationary equals inflationary, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. But that's the view is if we just borrow enough and create enough reserve assets that somehow that's inflationary and yet it isn't. I mean, we have evidence. We can look at Japan. It hasn't been. We can look here. We've done that. Still no sign of all this inflation. What would create inflation in your view? Well, (laughs) that's a good question because our monetary system by design uh, is really not inflationary. So what we would have to do is we would need to see interest rates go up. So the Fed would need to re- stop doing quantitative easing and start doing quantitative tightening. They would need to raise the federal funds rate. They would We'd need to get the banks to start lending, which they don't want to, but we need to get them to do that. And then we'd need to see the federal government reduce its debt. And actually, instead of running, um, a, or start running a surplus instead of a deficit and pay down uh, their debt, Th- those things. And, and of course, none of them would happen <laughs> yeah. rapidly, <laughs> right? But but if you wanted it, wanted to start down that path, and then the second thing that you would also want to do is br- break up the banks, uh, the large banks. And I mean, you just want to break up banks and then break them up again and break them up again. Because if you look at where money is created yeah, in a debt-based economy, it's created by the banks. It's not created sure. by the central banks, not created by the government. Is created when Steve and Leor go down to the bank and borrow money to buy something, you know, maybe we need or don't need, but that's where new money yeah. is created. Yeah. Um, so what you need to do is you need to get money moving around the system. And when you have a small number of banks, it doesn't work. You need to have a large number of banks. And so that would be the other thing they need to do is Very break up the banks and keep them broken up. Really interesting, Steve. Um, uh, I want to ask you about unemployment benefits because that's that's been a huge topic um, there are entire YouTube channels that are just dedicated to three or four times a day explaining what's going on with unemployment benefits and the unemployment boost, retroactive, everything like that. I want to ask you, um, uh, you've done a video on this, so I'd love for you to share the, the nuts and bolts of it. And I also want to ask you if you think that extending unemployment, giving people a boost and all, wouldn't, isn't this literally universal basic income just pronounced differently because you're making families and, and households dependent on the government. Um, it, it's going to be very hard for people to go off of that. Right. Well, I, you know, I think universal basic income, uh, which is a term I, I'm really not fond of, uh, it would be in perpetuity, right? And instead of saying we're going to give benefits just to those people who lost a job, we're going to give everybody a thousand a month that, you know, maybe under this income threshold or whatever the deal is. So I, it, in a way, is it maybe a quasi view of what UBI could be? Yes. The problem is um, the benefits aren't anywhere near that great. And so the risk we have right now, if Congress doesn't act, which at, as of our recording, they seem to be not wanting to do that, 
is there's about 13 and a half million, give or take, uh, Americans on some form of pandemic unemployment insurance. And those benefits okay. are going to end on December 26. And the, the risk is, okay, you know, you, if we come back to this, you know, insolvency event, well, how do I, how do I create one? Well, I put a lot of people on unemployment and then I eventually exhaust their benefits before they can get back to work. Or I make sure those benefits are less than they're making. And so that way their debt starts to squeeze them until they say, hey, you know what, pay, feeding my family is more important than making a car payment. Or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll fight the sheriff when he comes to try to, you know, kick me out of the house. You know, they'll, they'll make those decisions. And even what we've heard out of the Senate is they're only looking at like a one month extension of these benefits, which I, I said a while back that as soon as there is a vaccine or, you know, looks like something will work to, to slow this, Congress isn't going to be doling out money left and right. Their idea is, okay, well, you need to go get that, take your shot or whatever, you know, the solution would have been at, you know, when I first mentioned all of that and get back to work. And, the, you know, they don't want this perpetual money dole because if you look, you know, Republican or Democrat, you know, a Republican doesn't want to give money to Democrat. Democrats don't want to give money to Republicans. You know, they want to give it to their own party so they can, you know, work on their own reelection campaign. So the notion that they want to give money to everybody perpetually, yeah, I don't, I don't think they want to do that. But this is, it, you know, we're, we're seeing all the things that lead to an insolvency event. And even if they do extend the benefits, it's no guarantee. You know, there's too many businesses out there that will not make it through the winter. I mean, I feel sorry for all these people that are running restaurants. I mean, there so many of them are going to close. And, you know, as they fail, well, what about the businesses that support them? Well, they're going to lose business and shrink or potentially fail. And yeah. you lose enough small businesses, mid-sized businesses fail. You lose enough mid-sized businesses and the large businesses can't maintain. You know, it's, it's a slippery slope where we're going down here and it all eventually leads to people just saying, you know what, I'm not going to pay on my debt anymore. And boom, there you go. Yeah. Uh, very interesting uh, information. And obviously it, it makes a lot of sense why they had to, you know, do this uh, stop gate where, where they have to extend it until the 18th, because if they don't solve this, you talked about unemployment, but there's evictions, there's uh, uh, you know, shutting down the government. That's a million people right there. So th this is uh, this is big stuff. They they better uh, find their find their uh, compromise here. Um, yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that people understand is why. Well, why don't we just do universal basic income? We we can't perpetually borrow. I mean, yeah. there there is a limit to you know. Yeah. Could the government go out and borrow more money? Sure. Can the Fed you know? do more quantitative easing, but there is a limit to far how far this can go. Yes. And that's when people don't really, they just presume that, hey, they, this, this, we can do this for infinity. Well, no, we, we can't. I think and, it's even worse. I think they don't even understand what, what's happening. Right, because people just think money's being created out of thin air, when in fact, no, <laughs> we are actually borrowing it. And then and the challenge with that, and it's a, a, a chart that you know, I, I blatantly ripped off from uh, Raul Powell of Real Vision is the labor <laughs> force participation rate uh, against the velocity of money. And what it tells you, or and, and what I, did, I took that chart and then I, I took the total government debt, right? And I inverted it. Oh. And what you find out is if you invert the total government debt against the labor for part, force participation rate and the velocity of money, it tells you the more government borrows and the more debt it takes on, the fewer people are going to have jobs. So everyone says, we need to borrow more and give more money away. And it's like, great, because some of you are unfortunately not going to have jobs to go back to or businesses. I mean, you know, if, you if you're a small businesses and you fail, I mean, for those who are watching who run one or have one, I mean, they know how hard it is just to get a small business up and running and all the work that goes into it. You know, yeah. if it fails and you have to go back to the bank and say, well, I have a new idea. It's like, yeah, no way. <laughs> right? I mean, it, you know, the banks again are going to have to want to you know finance these small businesses. It's it's bad. I mean, it's going to get worse, unfortunately. With everything we just said, why is the retail investor the most complacent, the most bullish, the most optimistic, the most euphoric since the two since two thousand? I, I have to tell you, in November personally, I did so much sell. I I just took profits. Uh, on on many now obviously not everything I I, I have my core and, and whatnot but man I, I I just don't get it so 
you know, what fuels this uh, euphoria right now? Yeah, well, one of the, you, you, it's a generational issue and it's an issue of faith. I mean, boomers have always loved stocks. I mean, you think after going through two recessions, they, they would have learned their lesson, scale back the risk. Instead, they, you know, they had the financial services industry build them products that allowed them to take more risk in the equity market and had these you know, hedging components or whatever that would sell. I mean, they love, love, love equity, but they know better which is a problem because when this insolvency event happens, all these products and things that they've created to help hedge their risk are not gonna work the way they think. Now, on the other end, you have millennials who unfortunately have not had an event where they've lost a bunch of yeah. things. I mean, they're, they're too young. Yeah. And the stock market always relies on memory. You know, So you have these two groups, one that should remember but doesn't, and one that doesn't have a, an, a, a clue of what's a about. They look at history books, right? And they look at the charts and say, okay, well, that could happen. And then you have the extras in the middle going like, you both are crazy because I've, I've been here, done that, and I'm not doing it again. And the faith part comes into is the, the boomers believe in quantitative easing, and so do millennials. They all think that the quantitative easing can, can support and raise asset prices that all you have to do is take the max amount of risk. And anytime the market goes down, the Fed will do more QE, in QE. And for some reason, those reserve assets piling up at the banks will magically make, you know, a, a share of Amazon go higher. But there's no evidence to prove that. And the, the, the worst part is when this does happen, when the insolvency event happens and it turns out the QE doesn't actually do anything and can't prop up stock prices, people are going to go screaming for the sell button when, when they realize it doesn't work. Cause there's a, there's a, as you probably know, there's a mountain of risk sitting under this market. I think we talked about, you know, all the call options and at the level not seen since the dot com bubble. I mean, not, not, just, not seen ever. Oh, so, is it, is it now higher? Higher than the, the stock, but higher. Than <laughs> my yeah. I mean, it, it's just crazy. And, you know, people are going to lose a lot of money. You know, I, I remember, uh, after the great financial crisis, I met a guy, uh, I don't remember which tech company had his money in, but he was a multimillionaire. I mean, he he had way more money than he needed. And I mean, he was sitting pretty uh, and he lost 80% of his money. He went from being being able to, to do whatever he wanted for the rest of his life to having a couple hundred thousand bucks. You know, and I'm, and I was in the industry in during the great financial crisis and I would, I met people that were you know, in retirement or near retirement financially had what they need. And then they'd lost 50% of it. And it was like, I can't go back to work. You know, and, and that was the reality they were facing. They lost everything. And if you look at what's coming, you know, everyone's talking about there's going to be this massive boom in the economy. Well, think about this. If the boomers go through this again and lose half their money again, they're not going to take the risk a fourth time. Fool me once, fool me twice, you know, the third time. But there won't be a fourth time. They're too old. They won't take the risk. They're put, they'll, they'll buy bonds. They'll keep their money in cash. They'll take safe stuff. They'll cut their spending. They'll have no choice. And now we'll have to turn to the millennials because they are the biggest generation. And what's their problem going to be? Loaded up in debt. And they're going to have also lost you know, some money during this event. And they're going to have a whole new perspective on investing and how the world works. Interesting. Um, in closing, tightening lending requirements, which we talked about, yeah. uh, did a video on that. And I want you to couple that with home builder optimism, which is uh, skyrocketing. Because obviously, if you tighten all the lending requirements, the, the prices are going up. But um, yeah, please. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, here we have banks saying, we don't want loans. We, you know, we, we'll, we'll take you, but you better be pristine. You better have big income, lots of assets, you know. I mean, you better be in great shape. And yet you have people out there going crazy buying homes. And the last time all of this happened, I mean, again, great financial crisis, you know, banks tighten lending standards, credit started to contract and then boom, the system blows apart. And so I this think reminds credit, you of 2008 or 2000. Oh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. And, and what's scary to me is you have all these people that think that stock prices and home prices can never go down because of the Fed. And so they're, they're, they're willingly, hey, I will pay top dollar at a market peak, no worries. And I'm thinking, man, that's not going to go the way you think. You know, the Fed can't stop insolvency events. And when that happens and you see the credit contraction, I mean, that's what the banks are trying to do is they're trying to contract credit, get interest rates down so they can get their 
high net worth borrowers and who have plenty of money don't want to borrow and they're and they're also trying to get the fed to do more and then if they can succeed at that then maybe the government will come in and increase the, its loan guarantees they're having no luck the fed thinks eh, hey, we're doing okay the government is too busy doing whatever government doesn't do and <laughs> here they keep tightening 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 and i look at the weekly credit data and usually in recessions you don't see the year-over-year rate of change uh, contract until after the recession's over. It's pretty common. We're very close to seeing the year-over-year rate of change on, you know, on residential real estate, uh, on uh, commercial lending, and uh, even the total loans and leases go negative on a year-over-year basis. And in a debt-based economy, when you have a contraction of credit, you get a contraction of asset prices. I mean, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Stephen, are you, yes. are you bullish now on, on cash then? It's, it seems like everything you're saying is, you know, I, sh- I should be liquid. I should have a lot of cash. I should just wait, wait. What's the risk? Yeah. If I lose out, if, if I'm wrong, I didn't buy stocks at the highest levels in history. I didn't buy the real estate. If I'm right, you know, I'm, I'm a king. Yeah. You know, I said in, in my uh, uh, liquidity versus insolvency video, there's a reason I'm, lo- you know, you can be long the bond market because there's a lot of people unemployed on unemployment. The economy is not going to get better. The odds are rates will go down. So even if there's a recovery, there still will be a downward move in, in yields, an upward move in bond prices. And then you could just wait and try to catch, you know, stocks don't always go up forever. As we know, there, there, there will be corrections. And then you, you try to buy <clears> back <throat> in there. Or if I'm right, uh, which the data says I most likely will be, you cash in, you know, or your, you take your cash or your bond profits, sell those, and then you buy all the risk assets you, you can stuff in your goal at, uh, at the low because that's where wealth is created. And a lot of people don't realize that. They think you can buy high and chase a higher. The true wealth in this country uh, sells high and buys low. Are you long gold? My long gold? No. No. Okay, so you're long bonds. You're, you like mm-hmm. bonds, you like cash, you, and you're anticipating. Just- yeah, because if you look at gold, what happens during insolvency events? So, you know, again, what is an insolvency event? I can't pay my mortgage, right? Or, or a bill and, and, and me and lots of other people. So you have this discussion, you know, with, with, with your spouse or your family of what's important. Well, we need to keep the roof overhead, which we know if we don't pay, we can kind of we can keep the bank away for six or months or more and, and play that game. But I got to feed my family. And so what does that mean? I have to sell some things to keep the things I need. I can't just say, okay, repossess all my cars because, well, what if I get a job, right? How am I going to go interview? I got There's certain things I got to keep around. In insolvency events, people will sell things that they don't want to, such as gold, to keep the things that they need or to feed their family or to, or to take care of basic needs. Understood. And, yeah, and that's why you see gold go down. The other reason you'll see it go down, in my opinion, is uh, you'll, if I'm right, we'll see the uh, year over year rate change of the consumer price index go negative. That will cause real or inflation adjusted yields to go up. And when those go up, nominal yields go down and bond prices go up. And since gold is inversely correlated with real yields, then it usually goes down. You can go back, you know, I always encourage people go back and look at the great financial crisis. You see gold actually yeah. uh, goes down during that time. And, and what did it become? A great buying opportunity if you didn't chase it up the, the other side. You know, you still had an opportunity to buy in before it went up, you know, the next two or three years. What is your YouTube channel called? How can people research this? Uh, it's just my name. Uh, you can look me up. Uh, I think it's under Stephen Van Meter or Stephen Van Meter Financial. And three days a week, I do a macro show. On Sunday, I do a chart show. And then we're starting to dabble, maybe uh, bringing in uh, some, some new content on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Very nice. I love your channel. And Best of luck to you. We'll have a, this, a link in the description box to your website, to your uh, uh, YouTube channel. And this has been very fascinating and really interesting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for being a fan. And I look forward to all of your fans also being some of mine. Thank you, sir.